בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We are back here live from Jerusalem at nearly 2.30 in the morning because we promised you guys that throughout all of this very difficult times for the Jewish people and uh, really for the world at large, we have to uh, try to keep you guys in the right mindset to put things into perspective. Tonight's uh, shiur is going to be for the Refua Shlema for uh, Yosef ben Levana, uh, Rabbanit Levana bat Zara, Rav Efraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Zara bat Anat, Avim Mori David ben Esriya, Imim Morati Doris bar Joah, and all of the uh, victims of the terror acts that uh, took place just a couple of weeks ago by the Hamas Ishmaeli Mimach Shimon Bezichram, May HaKadosh Baruch Hu give good health and uh, just mental, spiritual, and physical health to all of the uh, victims of this and uh, have a Ilu Nishma to all of the people that have died as a result of all of this. And, uh, uh, and most importantly, uh, May HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring back all of the Shavuim, uh, uh, all of the hostages that are now in enemy hands. So with that being said, we uh, uh, of course have to always look at things from a Torah perspective and because if you say things from your perspective, from what you think, somebody can come out there and simply tell you, well, I don't think like you, I don't agree with you. Now, just like I uh, answered somebody that asked earlier about uh, uh, the uh, some people's opinion that uh, uh, my attitude is condescending and uh, uh, mean or whatever they said and I said it's fine they're f- they're free to think whatever they want to think but the proof is in the pudding the proof is in the actions if somebody is doing one thing and uh, that's uh, condescending then by all means it's condescending but if somebody's doing a lot of good to help a lot of people uh, then uh, the reality is, uh, you know, that whoever thinks that they're bad is wrong. So that's one of the things that a person needs to know, is that opinions are worthless. They're absolutely worthless. And the reason why they're worthless is because, number one, not everyone is going to agree with your opinion, and more times than not, the stronger your opinion is, the more people are going to disagree with it. Number two, you yourself are going to change your opinion, which means that even you yourself do not value your opinion as strongly uh, the day after you express it as you did the day you express it. And number three, God has factual information available to us. Why would anybody waste any time on opinion? Now, certainly, there are things that you could measure that, you know, based on you know certain things that... Uh, are in front of you, certain things that are factual, certain things that uh, you can uh, have an opinion on. There's no, uh, it's not a sin to have an opinion, but again, everyone has to understand that if you have human opinions versus God's opinion, obviously God's opinion always wins. And this is in essence what the point is of every one of our lectures, is to constantly explain to everyone, whoever's watching, whether it's the Wonderful students we have around the world uh, that Baruch Hashem continue to grow in number, uh, or it's the uh, enemies that also watch us carefully and uh, studiously and monitor every single word that we say just to see maybe they could get a clip uh, that they could distort and, uh, and publicize. And we have no problem with them publicizing our clips even after they distort them. Because the beautiful thing about the Torah is that the Torah says the truth will rise from under the ground. I admit, which means that even if you take the words of Torah that we say and you distort them in some way or another by cutting a clip, either way it'll bring good. And the reason why is because it's true. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu promises us that as long as we publicize this Torah, we're only going to be blessed. And one of the things that I showed many of you that have been following me over the years is that not only do we not care when uh, the, uh, the enemies, the, the Nazis or the uh, uh, other uh, anti-Semites around the world 
uh, take our clips and pub popularize them and, and publicize them in their own distorted way, but we actually like it. And the reason why is because we know that when people find out what the Torah says, and especially when it's such a strong opinion, such a new uh, uh, opinion to them, then they end up wanting to find out more. And they come to our channels, and they come to our websites, and they come to our different lectures, and they end up finding out more and more. And some of them that are actually looking for the truth end up changing their mind, just like a, uh, a person public publicized just maybe two, three months ago that uh, he actually discovered one of our uh, um, clips that was popularized by different anti-Semites. And he himself was as a Nazi, uh, was a very uh, a Nazi that hated Jews his whole life. And after he saw this rabbi say these things, he said, I want to hear more of what this rabbi said. And uh, lo and behold, what ended up happening is that this Nazi realized that everything he was told about the Jewish people was a complete lie. And in fact, he loved all of our teachings so much that today he watches all of the lectures, he uh, you know, shares them with other people, and he even wants to convert to Judaism. So just like the Torah promises, the Torah delivers. Now tonight, we're going to look at things from a certain perspective that perhaps some people haven't looked at, or perhaps they have, but not in the right uh, way, where... Everything that's going on in the news, and I've told you guys not to waste so much time on the news because it could uh, literally damage your mind. Uh, the more news that you watch, the less time you have to learn Torah, the more uh, you know, a, uh, confused you become when you learn Torah because you're, you're trying to uh, take uh, the information that people give you and their opinions and try to make a truth out of it, which is nearly impossible. But the point is, is that all of the information that is that is being publicized right now is getting scarier and scarier because you're looking at the facts. What are the facts? The facts are that the Jewish people were attacked just a few weeks ago and the massacre that took place here in Eretz Yisrael is the biggest massacre that the country has ever seen. Uh, certainly, there has been worse things that happened to the Jewish people throughout history, but since modern-day Israel... Uh, this is the worst thing that ever happened to them. The amount of uh, murders and, uh, and uh, hostages that were taken surpassed anything, any nightmare that anybody has ever had. Uh, but what makes it worse is that the enemy is, in essence, promising that they're going to try to do even worse things. And even worse, we're finding out that the enemy is much bigger than what we thought, because it's not just the people that attacked us, the Hamas terrorist, Ishmaelim Machshimam, but also others that agree with them, whether it's Iran, or it's a, uh, the um, a Yemen, or it's Jordan, or it's uh, all of the other Middle Eastern countries that hate us, and not, if that's not enough, you also have Russia and China throwing their hat into the uh, argument and threatening to attack as well, and in so many words, you're finding out that there's a lot of enemies out there, an enormous amount of enemies. And for those that uh, thought, okay, we have enemies, but we also have big allies. We have England, we have America, we have uh, Canada. We have a few big allies, so we're okay. But then we're finding out that uh, even our allies, our so-called allies, are not necessarily uh, as uh, strong as we would, uh, you know, uh, our alliance is not as strong as, uh, as we would like for it to be, to say it nicely, when uh, they're having protests against us in their own countries by hundreds of thousands of people. Hundreds of thousands of people from the LGBTQ community, from the Arab community, from the lefty liberal community, from all of these different communities are gathering together and literally cheering for the massacre of Jews, cheering for Israel's demise. And uh, you're, you're literally uh, watching with, in amazement of how did we survive this long? Literally, how did we survive this long? And as I've told you guys time and time again, the survival of the Jewish people each day is a miracle. Because if Hashem would allow 
the enemies to do what they actually want, it wouldn't even take 24 hours. It wouldn't even take 24 hours. So the fact that we survive, we know that all that all has to do with God's decision. God is obviously the one that decided that we're going to be his chosen people. God is the one that decided that uh, we are going to live forever and our enemies will eventually go to hell. Now, with that being said, we have to look at the Torah. What is the Torah? Where does the Torah say such things? In this week's parasha, parashat Lech Lecha. For anyone that uh, is new to the lectures, you're always going to see that in our lectures, we not only bring you the Torah, but we also bring you the Torah, that portion of that week, to show you how the information we need to know is also in that week's. Meaning that the Divine Torah is a living, dynamic Torah, and it's not some uh, textbook that uh, they, uh, you know, that you put on the shelf and simply, uh, you know, pick and choose what you want to hear. The Torah Kedusha starts Parashat Lech Lecha by letting us know about our forefather Avraham, Avraham Avinu. He is the one that uh, was tested in number of ways, ten specific tests uh, that were given to Avraham Avinu were beyond anything that anyone in the world could actually handle. And in this week's parasha, Akadosh Baruch Hu tells Avraham Avinu, go for yourself from the land, from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you, and him who curses you, I will curse. And all of the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Here, Akadosh Baruch Hu, distinguishes Avraham Avinu from the rest of the world forever. In so many words, he's promising him that his descendants are going to be great. His descendants are going to be a blessing. His descendants are going to bring a blessing to the world. And in fact, anyone that blesses his descendants will be blessed himself. Anyone that chooses to be their enemy and curse them is bringing a curse upon themselves. Furthermore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, tells Avraham Avinu in chapter 12, verse number 7 in the book of Genesis, Hashem appeared to Avraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. And he's talking about the land of Israel. Here we see one of the many times where HaKadosh Baruch Hu decides that he's going to give this land, this specific land out of the entire universe. And needless to say, out of the entire earth, this land belongs to to Avraham Avinu's descendants, to the Jewish people. It doesn't belong to anybody else. It doesn't matter what any government or government association or, uh, or, 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 or politician thinks. The land of Israel is owned by God and he gave it to the Jewish people. And it's mentioned in this parasha multiple times. This is why when a Jewish person argues with anybody else out there about Israel's right to exist and Israel's right to the land, it's literally a meaningless argument. And the reason why is because if you believe in the Torah, whether you're Jew or Gentile, that means that you agree that the land of Israel belongs to the Jews. No questions asked. Why? Because who owns everything? God. Who did he give it to? He gave it to Avraham and his descendants, to the Jewish people. And he never changed his mind. He never said, listen, I decided that I'm going to take it back from you. This is something that HaKadosh Baruch Hu mentions many times in the Torah, like in Parashat Balak, where he says that uh, uh, the, uh, Hashem is not a human that changes his mind from one day to the other. Once he says something, that's it. This is what it is. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Avraham Avinu, this land is yours. I'm promising you this land. Now, the story of Avraham is extensive and there's a lot of other details we'll go over on later on this week. But one of the things I wanted to delve into tonight and uh, try to get to a point pretty quickly is to make sure that everybody understands what we're dealing with here. Because the question is, can we win this actual war that we're in? We are fighting against an enormous enemy that's not just Hamas. That's not just a nation, a people that literally terrorizes even its own citizens, trains children to become terrorists, lives off of terrorism, 
wants to kill, wants to destroy. That's the only thing they produce is dead bodies. That's the only thing. If you ask, what's the most recent achievement of the uh, of, of of these people? The only answer you're going to get is death, or something to do with it. That's all they do. They haven't developed any new technology. They haven't developed any new medicines. They haven't helped their own people. Their own people struggle and suffer because of them. And instead of taking the billions of dollars that different governments give them from around the world, including the Israeli government, instead of using that money to develop a country, to develop a society of peace and, and success, what do they do? They buy more weapons. They buy more weapons in order to kill more people in order to continuously make this monster bigger and more vicious than it is. And what better example do we have than the interview that came out over the last 24 hours or 48 hours, where seven of the, uh, of the um, uh, terrorists that attacked the Jewish people on that uh, bloody day of October 7th are interviewed in their own language so there's no confusion and it's translated with subtitles in different languages, in Hebrew, in English, and I'm sure in many other languages. And uh, if you understand Arabic, then you can certainly verify that uh, what's written on the subtitles is actually being said. And the point being is, is that you're seeing the information of what took place, what was the plan, what's the ideology from the people themselves. So you can no longer say, no, this is speculation. No, they didn't do this. No, you guys are just uh, propaganda. No, you're actually hearing the terrorists themselves say exactly what horrors they did, what horrors they planned, what horrors they intend on doing, who is behind them, who is supporting them. They even talk about the fact that uh, for every hostage that someone would take, they would get a reward promised to them of a house and $10,000. And therefore, initially, the biggest goal was to get as many Jewish hostages as possible. Uh, you're, 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 you're hearing them talk about all the horrible, horrific, horrific things that they did. And even they themselves mention a couple of times during that uh, 12 or so minute interview that uh, everything that they did and everything that they're taught contradicts the Quran that many people say that they, uh, they follow. The Quran says don't kill women and children, but the actions are the opposite. Why are the actions the opposite? Very simple. Because the very same leaders that teach the Quran say, yeah, don't kill women and children that's, uh, except the Jewish people. Don't terrorize uh, except the Jewish people. Meaning, the hypocrites. Whatever it says doesn't actually matter to them. Because the terrorists themselves are saying they killed they, 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 they did horrible things that I don't even want to mention because I've already mentioned it. It's enough mental scars for people. Point being is, you have an enemy here that breeds fire. That, that literally has no remorse whatsoever in them. There's not an ounce of sorrow in any of these people. Had they been given the chance they would do it again. The fact that they're still alive is a miracle. I don't, I don't know how stupid the, the, the system is to allow these people to live. Maybe it's just for the sake of having these interviews, but hopefully they don't keep them alive because these people certainly have lost their right to exist. And anyone that, uh, that is, uh, was part of it and supports it is uh, certainly on the same, uh, uh, same category as well. But here you see an enemy that's very different than the Jewish people. You're never going to meet a Jewish person that can do what these evil monsters did. 
Never. It's simply never going to happen. And in fact, the evil they did is small in comparison to the evil that they want to do. When their similar ideology brethren of Ishmaelim in Hezbollah or Al-Qaeda or ISIS or any of the other monsters. When you start thinking about if this is the ideology, this is the viciousness, this is the monsters that are walking the streets here and this is what they're teaching their children, how are we going to survive? And you say, yeah, but we have a strong army. Well, uh, the army didn't show up on that day. What if it doesn't show up again? And even if it does, if you compare their numbers to our numbers, you see that even if you have a very big army, even if you have great weapons, when you compare 100,000 to 500 million, 1 billion people that want to kill you, even if you have great soldiers, literally, the num numerical difference between the two is so significant that it reminds us of the story, the biblical story of what happened when Sanchaliv, who was the conquered nearly the entire world and came to conquer the last part of the world that he has not conquered yet, which was Jerusalem. Sanchaliv had 185,000 battalions. So this is not 185,000 soldiers. This is 185,000 groups of soldiers. That the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin says that by the time they crossed the river, just a little bit of water that sticks to the garments as they cross, by the time people, they all crossed, the river, the river was dry. That's how big it was. That's how numerous, the, the, the numbers were astounding. And he himself, this evil Sanchirif, said that if he would just, once he saw the size of Jerusalem in comparison to his army, he says, oh, I, didn't, I don't even need to spit and I'll drown them. Meaning he has so many soldiers that even literally if they just spit, they would drown Jerusalem. So the numerical difference, the size between the two is so, so significant, it seemed like it was a losing battle. But Chizkiyahu did something that I don't believe anybody else in the world that's running the government or even part of the government is even aware of, needless to say, would do. And he went to sleep peacefully after telling God, you promised that if we follow the Torah, you're going to take care of the wars. I followed the Torah by studying it. I followed the Torah by teaching it. I followed the Torah by forcing everyone in the people to make sure to learn Torah or they get punished. Literally put the sword in the ground. He said, whoever doesn't learn Torah, instead we'll get the sword. In a relatively short period of time, the amount of Torah that the Jewish people knew and studied was so extraordinary that even children that were six years old knew the most complicated laws of the Torah. So said, so Chizkiyahu, who was a descendant of King David, says that I did my part. So I can go to sleep. And that's what he did, even though Sanchiri was right outside of the right side of Jerusalem. And Akadosh Baruch Hu delivered the promise that he made by sending Malach Gavriel, who in a single moment took the soul out of every single one of those soldiers millions and millions of soldiers only leaving three people alive which was Sanchariv and his two sons now 
we see that when God fights our wars, it doesn't matter who our enemy is and how numerous they are. In this week's parasha, we see the same thing. We see that our forefather, Avram Avinu, didn't have a massive army. Didn't have the drones and the atomic bombs. He didn't have any of that. Avram Avinu hears that there is a war between the four kings led by Nimrod, who is also known as Amraphel, against the five kings. And Avram Avinu does not get involved. It's not, his, it's not his fight. They want to fight among each other. Let them fight. But everyone in the world knows that Avram Avinu is very influential. Avram Avinu, he's the man of God. Avram Avinu, when he says something, people follow. And therefore, they said, we have to get Avram Avinu into this fight. How? They go and they attack Sodom in order to capture a hostage named Lot. Lot was the nephew of Avram Avinu, who also looked exactly like Avram Avinu. So these kings said, listen, either way we win. We can tell people that we captured Avram Avinu. And once we capture Avram Avinu, everyone will realize that they all have to bow to us. They all have to serve us. And that's it. We want world domination. But if they find out that it's really not Avram Avinu, that's good too. Why? Because then the word will be spread everywhere that we captured his nephew, which will force Avram Avinu to come in, uh, come under our control also. The last thing they ever thought was that Avram Avinu is going to go and fight them. Because that Avram Avinu didn't have, Avram didn't have an army. But after Avram finds out that his nephew, Lot, was captured, he goes with his servant Eliezer, In 318, 318 soldiers, which were really his servants, and goes and fights against all of those nations. Now the Chamim say it really wasn't 318 soldiers. It was really only Avram and Eliezer. It was only two. Only two soldiers. Who are the soldiers? The old man, Avraham, almost 100 years old, and a servant, Eliezer. So why does it say 318 in the Torah? The gematria, numerical value, of the name Eliezer was 318. It doesn't mention the name Eliezer. It says 318. So the Chamim say 318 is Eliezer. Why? Because he was a hero equivalent to 318 men. But needless to say, when you're fighting millions of people, you're fighting four different countries, and you have two people. No one's even going to sit there to watch the fight because it won't last long enough to even eat the popcorn. But Torah says that Avram not only went to war, but he pursued them. He chased after them. What kind of weapons did he have? He didn't have weapons. As soon as he got to the area where his enemy was in sight, millions of them, literally so many of them that even the, the sky became dark. Avram Avinu and Eliezer run towards them with full force. Imagine this. It's an old man, nearly 100 years old, and a younger man running full force, attacking millions of people with swords 
and boulders and horses and elephants and all types of things. And they're saying, charge! What? They're, they're, they're charging us? Everybody starts laughing. Until Avraham Avinu and Eliezer take some sand from the ground and some straw and throw it at them. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ishtabach Shimo La'ad turns every single grain of sand that came out of their hands into an arrow. Every single straw that came out of their hand into a spear. Imagine a handful of sand, how many grains of sand it has, and it all turns into arrows, and they all hit, without needing the sensors of the Iron Dome or any other advanced weaponry. They have the ultimate weaponry, which is a Kadosh Baruch Hu. And these two people defeated four different countries and their entire armies were completely annihilated. Why? They knew the most important thing when it comes to war. En od milvado. There is nothing else but God. The moment you think that you are going to win the war, that your weapons and your clever mind and your this and your that, that means you think there's more than just God. You've already lost. And the truth is, more important than any other time in history, is that right now, not only are the enemies of Israel outnumbering Israel and its army in extraordinary measures, the amount of enemies that we have surrounding us, among us, across the ocean, across the same continent, all over the world, including the so-called allied countries. The amount of enemies that Israel has surpasses its population by a factor of a, of, of a thousand. Meaning that even if every single Israeli went to war, it wouldn't even be 10% of the amount of enemies that they have right now. So when you compare here, right now, Am Yisrael is in a position that we are forced to know what the Gemara says in Masechet Sota, page 49b, which is, at the end of days, you will have nothing to rely on other than your Father in Heaven. And Od Milvado, there's nothing else but Hashem. Your army is not going to help you. Your government's not going to help you. Your allies are not going to help you. Your weapons are not going to help you. And in fact, anyone with a clever mind that's not delusional and not so arrogant to the point of stupidity knows exactly this to be true. It's simply impossible for Israel to win this war if not for HaKadosh Baruch Hu winning it for us. Because the enemy is literally everywhere. It's everywhere. It doesn't, there's nowhere you could look and not find your enemy. And a lot of Jews are only finding out now what the Jews felt nearly 80 years ago before the Holocaust, where all of a sudden their Polish neighbor, their German neighbor, their Russian neighbor, their neighbor wherever they were, in the Middle East, in Tripoli, in uh, Syria, in all of these countries, all of a sudden the neighbor that they used to say good morning to in a different language, the neighbor that the kids sometimes played together, the neighbor that they coexisted with in peace, became a murderer, became a person that wanted to kill them. There was no place they could look and not see a murderer, not see somebody salivating to kill them. That's what happened before the Holocaust. In fact, 
Some of the saddest stories were of the agony that Jews that have assimilated to the point of intermarriage, where they married women or men of other religions, ended up expressing more sorrow to the point where they wanted to die because the people that put them in the concentration camps were their spouses. Literally, there was no place a, per a Jew could look and not see their enemy, including their house. If they were assimilated, if they had a neighbor, if they lived in a certain community, if they worked for a certain job. And the Jewish people are not very different than that right now. Even though it looks different, the truth is opposite. If you pay attention to what's going on, it's not only that the enemies are all very interested in fighting, and they're all very vocal about it, but it's somehow become the trend to become anti-Semitic. People are proud of it without even knowing anything about it. They want to join it like as if it's a uh, winning the lotto. People that have never met Jews or even know that there's a connection between the Jews and Israel are still choosing to go against the Jewish people and, and literally supporting the massacre of the Jewish people that took place in the last couple of weeks. So if you look at the numbers, if you look at the statistics, if you look at the bottom line, and you don't include God in this equation, it's impossible for Israel to win the war. But the moment that you have God in the picture, the very same God that says to Avraham Avinu that he's blessed. That all of his descendants will be blessed. That the land is his and his descendants. That Avraham is God's beloved. The moment you add God, the God of Israel, to the equation, nothing matters. The number of enemies, irrelevant. The place where the enemies are, completely insignificant. The weapons they have, not even a thought. The weapons we have, obviously, it's not important. Why? Because if God showed our forefather, Avram, that you can defeat the entire world of enemies with sand on the ground, because that's the will of God, then needless to say, you can defeat all of the enemies even without sand. In fact, I think that if they actually had the blessing of the sand that Avram had today, they would throw away all of the weapons and use that instead because it was more effective. You didn't even have to aim. You just had to throw it in the air. That was your effort. Throw it in the air. Let Hashem do the rest. Now, how do we get a Kadosh Baruch Hu to give us a blessing like he gave to our forefather Avram. Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein has a sefer called Chuke Chemed. It's a series of books that goes over the different parts of the Talmud. And in Tractate Masechet Shabbat, Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein goes into the sugya, into the question of sports and, uh, and boxing and soccer and whether uh, certain things are allowed, not allowed. Are you allowed to box? Are you not allowed to box? Is it because the Torah says that you're not allowed to hit somebody uh, just for, for entertainment or sport? Uh, you know, so is there permission, no permission, and so on and so forth. 
But then Arab Zilberstein brings a question, a question that should affect every single person on planet Earth, if they understood the question. A question that I only learned the answer to it from this perspective today with my very dear Rav, Rav Ephraim Kachlon. This question is a question we've discussed times and times again in the past, but the answer is the first time we ever heard this answer. And what's the question? Why do people watch sports such as boxing and soccer, fighting? Why? What desire brings a person to spend 90 minutes watching a bunch of people chase a piece of leather and fight over who's going to kick this piece of leather into a net? An hour watching a bunch of really tall people run around with another piece of leather and put it into after flying in the air or throwing it in the air in a basket or a bunch of big and athletic people full of equipment looking like little gladiators of Amalek with helmets pretty much trying to destroy whoever is in front of them that's not on their team just for the sake of putting this pig skin at the end of the field of the opposing teams. And you see that people spend not only hours and hours of time watching these sports, hours and hours of time discussing the sports, what the team should do, and how they won, and I can't believe they lost, and why did they sign this guy, and they should fire the manager, and the owner should sell the team, and they literally live their lives just drowning their minds in sports. But let's not forget that people love, throughout all of history, before these sports came to being, People love different sports until this day, which is the sport of gladiators, fighting, whether it's the martial arts fighting or boxing. People love to watch people fight. And the more gruesome, the more people watch it. And if watching this fight for 10, 20 minutes is not enough, people will watch another fight or watch the same fight again. And over and over again. As if this time he's not going to punch him. Like he did the first time. As if this time the, go, the ball is not going to go in the net. Like he did last time. As if this time he's not going to pass the ball like he did in the first time. And people watch these sports. And they talk about these sports. And they live their life around these sports. And they start gambling. And they start doing all types of things where their lives become... One with the sport. So the, of course, this is unhealthy. Certainly, it's not good for marriage. It's not good for you to bring up a, a family with such a mindset. There's an enormous amount of wasted time. Chachamim called Moshav Letzim. It's a place of jesters and losers that waste their time doing this. If you want to exercise, you want to run a little bit, you want to uh, you know, stay healthy, there's no problem with that. To go and spend hours and hours of your day a week watching sports, watching people beat up each other, watching people fight over a ball, there's simply no positive thing that will ever come out of it. But yet people do it. The question is why? If he kicks the ball into the net or he misses, your life will never change. If he signs the contract with that team or not, your rent will never be paid by him. 
if he retires or he stays on for another year, will certainly not help your children's education. If he wins the fight by punching the guy in the face really hard, or he gets punched in the face and gets knocked out, will certainly not help your life in any way, shape, or form. So why do people do it? That's the question that the genius of Rabbi Tzach Zilberstein brings in his book. And he brings an answer from Rav Nathan Wachtenfegel. Wachtenfegel Rav Wachtenfegel was a extraordinary Talmud Chacham from Lakewood and he gives an answer that really puts things in perspective. And he says to the question of why do people, where does the desire to watch people play sports and boxing and all of this aggressive things, where does it come from? It comes from the fact that people were created to fight battles. What battle? The battle against the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. Battle your desires. Battle your weaknesses. That's the battle that you were created to. Every single second you're alive, you're supposed to overcome some type of test, some type of battle. Somebody did something wrong to you and you have a desire to yell at them, insult them in public. If you do, you're a loser. But if you don't, you're a hero. Because that means you overcame your desire to do bad things. Yeah, but it's justified. He did something bad to me first. You doing something bad to him back is not going to make you a winner. You allowing one of your children to make you lose your temper to the point where you break stuff that cost you thousands of dollars is not only not going to help your child become a better child, but it's certainly not going to help your life become a better life. So by overcoming that desire to be destructive, to be violent, overcoming the desire to be stingy, to be arrogant, overcoming the desire to do the things that are the opposite of God, those are what you were created to do, to fight battles. But, says the Rav Bochen Feigel, the crazy and arrogant one, the crazy and arrogant one, the crazy and arrogant one who does not want to fight these battles, doesn't want to fight these battles of overcoming desires. He has a desire to overeat, he overeats. He has a desire to cheat on his wife, he cheats on his wife. He has a desire to steal money, he steals money. He doesn't want to fight. And because the crazy and arrogant one who doesn't win the battles versus the evil inclination ends up using his energy to desire other fights and battles of boxing and soccer. Meaning that who is the one that's spending all of his time watching these sports? Who is the one that's spending all of their energy surrounded by violence it's the one that doesn't want to fight the real meaningful battle in life. The battle of becoming a decent human being. The battle of serving God according to God's commandments. When you don't want to fight that battle, the soul that's in you still has a desire to fight battles. But since you don't want to fight the battle that you're supposed to, the soul's craving to fight battles leads a person to go and look for other battles. And the most common battles, says Rav Natan Buchenfegel, is the battles of sports. Boxing, people beating up each other, even though they did nothing to each other, people running after a ball, people hitting each other, all this stuff. Why? 
He wants a battle. And a battle he will have. But who is he? Is he a amazing person that just happens to like sports? He could be a person that likes sports. He could be amazing at a lot of things. But spiritually speaking, he's a loser. And Rav Ochen Vegel calls him a crazy and arrogant person who does not want to fight the real battles in life. So with that being said, Rabotai, that means that as the Gaon Vilna said over 200 years ago, the ultimate purpose of life is to overcome our negative character traits. And the reason why out of the 613 commandments that we have from the Torah, not a single one of them tells us to overcome these character traits is because the point of all of those mitzvot is for you to overcome the character traits. Meaning that's the purpose of all of the mitzvot. By waking up in the morning and realizing you have to fulfill the mitzvah of saying thank you to Hashem for bringing back your soul, that automatically improves your character trait by making you more grateful. And even more so, it makes you acknowledge the things that are being given to you so you're not ungrateful. Because grateful is good, but if you're grateful for some things and ungrateful for others, it's not a good, uh, it's not, it's not a good uh, uh, success story. You have to not only be grateful, but you also have to know how to not be ungrateful. And every morning... A Jew fulfills a mitzvah that allows him to do that. Then he has to go do his bodily needs and he has to say thank you again. But specifically thank you for allowing my body to work in specific ways. And now it's not only teaching a person to be grateful to his creator for allowing his body to function, but it also shows him the miraculous nature of the creation itself, how your body functions, how you have holes in your body, but yet they remain open, but all the air doesn't just come out and you run out of breath, but all the blood doesn't just fall out and you die. Even though the holes are open, everything's okay. In fact, if something opens that's not supposed to be open, the body has an internal mechanism to take the liquid blood that you have and turn it into something hard. Now, if that happened inside your body, you'd have a heart attack. You'd have a brain aneurysm. You'd have something that could kill you. But it only happens if there's a wound. And it's not because of the air. Because if you spilled a bunch of blood it wouldn't clot. It only clots if it's still in the body. If it's trying to protect the person from losing all of his blood. So when a person does the Asher Yatsar blessing and he realizes that he wouldn't be able to survive if all of the holes that are open close and all of the closers open it teaches a Jew about the extraordinary nature and miracles of creation. It makes him appreciate the Creator and love the Creator even more. And each mitzvah that will follow during that day, whether it's the blessings that you say in the morning, or it's the blessings you say in the afternoon, or it's a blessing that you say before you smell something good, or it's the blessing that you say before you eat something, or the blessing you do after you eat something, or the blessing for all types of things. In addition to the prayers, in addition to the learning, in addition to everything, you're still blessing God. It's constantly a reminder to not only show gratitude, but to know what you're grateful for. So we see here that there are our ultimate purpose is to utilize the Torah and its mitzvot to become better. Like our forefather Avraham, that was called the man of God. 
like our forefather Avram, that God turned sand into firepower the world has never seen before. More powerful than any bomb or missile that the world ever had or ever will have. Where he and his servant Eliezer single-handedly defeated an enemy that's so much bigger than them, it was a waste of time to count. We want that blessing. Not only because it's nice to have a blessing. Not only because we're related to Avram Avinu. But because the truth is, Rabotai Karim, stop fooling yourself to think that we can win this war without it. It doesn't matter what weapon we have. It doesn't matter what army we have. It doesn't matter what ally we have. Because if God wants, all of what we think we have could simply be shut down. Just like it was shut down two weeks ago. The strong army didn't show up. The strong defense didn't work. The so-called strong ideology failed. The godless belief system failed. Everything we thought and everything we believed failed. That's what the victims are saying. But Torah says, the only reason why it failed is because it was against the Torah. In fact, it never succeeded even before that time. It's only that HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed it to succeed. And people have to realize that the enemy is so much bigger, so much more powerful that only a fool would think that we could win without the help of Hashem. And I don't just mean a little bit of help. I mean Hashem doing the whole thing. No less than what he did for Hizkiyahu. There is no other way. How do we get there? How do we get that blessing? I believe that Rabbi Tzak Zilberstein brought this answer in order for us to read it and understand that it applies to each and every single one of us. Where not only we shouldn't waste our time on the news or watching sports or doing things that are not connecting us to our creator, not perfecting us as people. It's not only for that. It's not only don't waste your time, but rather... Utilize the time that you do have in this world. You're alive. You're functioning. Now go use that. To learn Torah. To follow it. In order to become better. In order to become a better human being. In order to become a better servant of God. In order to become a better Jew. In order to become a better Noahide. In order to become someone that is fulfilling their purpose and is not living a purposeless life. Stop condemning things. Stop wasting your time thinking that your opinion matters. It doesn't. In fact, even you will see that in the very near future about your own opinion. The only thing that matters is God's opinion. God made sure that he gave us enough evidence to show us that it's worthwhile to listen to his opinion. Because the same situation that we find ourselves in today, surrounded by enemies, and they have hostages that we care about, there was only one time that we ever won such a war. And it wasn't because of an atomic bomb, and it certainly wasn't because it was a huge number of people. Rather because Avram Avinu perfected himself as a servant of God. Perfected himself as a human being that made God his priority number one. But not the God that was 
soothing and always giving and loving no matter what. But rather, the God that is going to reward and punish. Or reward the righteous or punish the wicked. This Rabotai Karim is very, very important for each person to know. Because if you don't know this, that means you're living a life without a purpose, without a direction, without any confirmation that you're even going in the right direction. But once you start this and you start learning Torah in order to perfect yourself as a human being, you'll start realizing that it's not just the big reward you will eventually get in heaven, in Olam Abba. No, no, no. It's also the reward that you get living in this world where you know that every single day that you wake up, you have another opportunity to fulfill your purpose. You have another opportunity to live a purposeful life. You have another opportunity to save your fellow that's living a purposeless life and a life without a purpose. May it be his will that each and every single one of us will take these words to heart and engrave them there in order for us to live a purposeful life according to the Holy Torah and by then HaKadosh Baruch Hu will fight our wars and we shall remain silent. Thank you for learning with me. I'll take maybe a couple of questions, a little late and I'm tired, but we'll see if we can answer something that's relevant. Rabbi, why is my last name Ashkenazi and I'm a Sephardi Jew? Uh, well, it could be that there is a marriage between Sephardis and Ashkenazis within your family. Uh, but you should know also that uh, last names are a relatively recent invention. In the old days, and I don't mean old days like a million years ago, I mean old days like in the previous generation, maybe a uh, hundred years ago, less in some cases. Um, there wasn't last names. People didn't have last names. They would simply call a person by their first name and whatever they did. And they, they would say, you know, this is uh, David, uh, uh, the uh, Anagal, the one that's a uh, carpenter. This is a Shimon, the, uh, you know, the builder. This is, you know, everyone was, was, was called by their profession. There wasn't last names. So whether your last name is a uh, Ashkenazi last name or a Sephardi last name, don't really put too much value into it. Uh, your real value is in your first name and what you actually do with it, meaning how you serve God. There's not really uh, uh, become a Muslim, never. I'm in 
nothing, nothing material here that I could use. It uh, needs answers. Just a bunch of flags and foolish comments by most people. Uh, nothing. All right. Perhaps we'll wait for uh, some smarter questions to come tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much for learning with me. And Bezot Hashem HaKadosh Baruch bless each one of the people that blesses Am Yisrael and curse each one of the people that cursed Am Yisrael, just like he said he will do in the book of Genesis in Parashat Lech Lecha. to all the good people. Hold to